I'm Lisa Hanairo with the Council of State Governments Midwestern Office. I staff the caucus and am managing the logistics for this webinar. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. The slides from the presentation and the recording will be posted on the caucus's website this afternoon at the address you see on the screen. You'll receive a follow-up message with a link to the recording and also the address where you can find both the recording and the slides. To reduce the possibility of feedback or other external noise, while the presentation is running, the conference will be in listen-only mode. After the presentation, we'll open up the line for questions. We want this webinar to be interactive, so if you have a question, please let us know either by typing your question in the GoToWebinar Questions pane or by clicking on the hand icon to raise your hand. If I see that your hand is raised, I'll unmute your line so that you can ask your question. If you accidentally click on the button to raise your hand, uh, just click it again and it'll turn off. Next, a few tips if you do plan to ask a question or if you're one of the people who will be reporting on legislation later this morning. Um, if you're using your telephone, please make sure to enter your audio PIN, which you'll find in the audio pane. Press pound, then the two-digit number, then pound again. If you selected voice over IP and are using your computer's microphone and speakers, please test your settings by clicking on the test settings link in the audio pane. Your connection to the webinar audience will be muted, so don't worry about anyone hearing you as you test your microphone. If your computer's microphone doesn't appear to be working, you should call in using one of the telephone numbers listed in the audio pane. And make sure to enter your two-digit PIN. And finally, after the webinar, you'll all be asked to take a very brief survey, just three questions. Please take the time to fill out the survey so we can get feedback to help us improve our webinars. I'll now turn the floor over to the Chair of the Caucus, Minnesota Senator Ann Rest. Good morning, everyone. Um, our Great Lakes Great Webinar Series for 2014 continues today with a webinar that takes a look at legislation at the federal level as well as in our states and provincial capitals. We are very pleased to have as our speaker this morning Ms. Danielle Chesky, Director of the Northeast Midwest Institute's Great Lakes Program. Danielle has spoken during our, during our webinars before, and we're glad that she is able to be with us again today. As part of her work, she assists the bipartisan Great Lakes Task Forces within the U.S. Congress. She is here today to provide us with an update on some of the key proposals and Great Lakes news from the nation's capital. Danielle is originally from the Midwest. She was born in Cleveland, Ohio although some consider that the East, and, and grew up in Saginaw, Michigan, where she learned to uh, fish on the Great Lakes. Prior to joining the Northeast Midwest Institute, Danielle served as Legislative and Fishery Management Plan Coordinator for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, where she coordinated interstate fisheries management plans for nine species groups along the Atlantic coast. I want to note that after Danielle is done with her presentation, we will have some time for questions, and then we'll go around the region to hear about legislation in the Great Lakes states and provinces. I've asked the members of the caucus's executive committee to provide a roundup of legislative proposals in their jurisdictions. So we'll start with those members who are on the line. Time permitting, and if there is interest, we'll open up the lines for other legislators to say a few words about any legislation they have introduced. Danielle, thank you very much for participating in our webinar today, and I'll turn the floor over to you now for your presentation. Thank you so much, Senator. Good to be with you folks again. Uh, excited to have a little bit more, I think, successes to talk about this year. Um, so without any further ado, we'll get going. I appreciate the wonderful introduction. Uh, let's see. Can you guys see my screen all right? Yes. Great. Wonderful. So in terms of the legislative update uh, that we're going to be going through, we've got a couple different categories of um, states of legislation. Uh, we've got some things that have actually passed, uh, some things that are sort of in the works, and then some opportunities for the coming year. And so I'll try to keep it within those uh, parameters. Uh, so the first thing just wanted to chat about is the Farm Bill, which passed. Uh, Senator Stabenow from Michigan uh, was one of the leads on that. Um, and there's been a lot of great excitement around that, both here in D.C. and then I think throughout the country as well. Um, 
some big notes on that. The conservation programs, there's quite a few in the past. Um, those have been consolidated and streamlined. Um, the agency is still working through how those uh, different programs will be structured, but uh, we already saw some of the changes in how um, the programs will operate in the fiscal year 15 request. So they're getting moving on that very quickly. I think some other big uh, wins that folks talked about from the bill um, was the tie of conservation and compliance to crop insurance. Um, additionally, as part of the Farm Bill, uh, the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, was cut by about $8 billion over 10 years. Uh, just to sort of to put that into f reference, the Senate bill cut about $4 billion and the House bill about $40 billion, or zero. Um, so this definitely came down somewhere in between. Um, so the bill itself has only been enacted, an, an actual law, for about a month now. Um, so as I said, people here are very excited to see where that's going to go. Um, there are quite a few different uh, groups, including uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, American Farmlands Trust, and others who are holding uh, webinars, informational webinars, on uh, what the uh, program implementation could mean. So happy to provide some links and stuff if folks are interested. Uh, moving on, the Sleeping Bear Dunes bill um, that was introduced in the House and Senate has finally passed and was just signed yesterday by the President. Um, it adds over 32,000 acres um, as designated as wilderness as part of the dunes. Um, additionally, as part of the bill, uh, there are certain rights and accesses pr preserved, including access to beaches and roads, tribal and property rights, as well as uh, state control of hunting and fishing within the National Lakeshore. On the Senate side, this was primarily pushed by Senator Levin as well as Senator Stabenow. And on the House side, um, this was primarily uh, Congressman Dan Benishuk's office. So um, folks here are very excited. Uh, it's been a while since the wilderness bill has been passed. There's uh, been sort of an aversion just to that term. And so I think all the offices did um, a really good job, and the coalition and the task force helped out as well with uh, uh, explaining the larger benefits of this, even though it's a quote-unquote wilderness bill. Um, so those are two things that have really um, passed so far. Um, moving on to WERDA, the Water Resources Development Act. It's currently in conference between the House and the Senate. The Senate passed their bill back in May, I believe, and then the House passed their bill back in October. Um, so this has been going on in conference since then. Um, big pieces to this that are very important to the Great Lakes is designation of the Great Lakes Navigation System. I think some folks really see this as an opportunity to take care of the larger um, system that is the Great Lakes. Um, it's very difficult to get something from Duluth out the seaway if you can't get through St. Mary's or the uh, huron Erie Corridor. Um, so I think this looks at this uh, approach more as of a system, as I said, rather than on the coasts, let's say, where LA and Seattle compete against each other. Um, additionally, there's some uh, terms in there regarding the use of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund money. Um, this has been an area of contention in recent years as the amounts coming in from the trust fund have not equaled what's been going out. And there's continued to be a backlog in dredging and other maintenance issues, um, both in the Great Lakes and throughout the country. Uh, there's no requirement to fully utilize the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund in either the House or the Senate final bills that are being conferenced, um, but there certainly is uh, encouragement of additional um, uses of it. Additionally, um, both bills included some sort of set aside for smaller harbors. Um, they use different terms for them, but the, the intent there is the same. Um, additionally, one point of concern for the Great Lakes was allowing the use of the funds for what's called expanded uses. Uh, so traditionally, uh, the funds can only be used for operations and maintenance of the designated uh, channels that are congressionally authorized. And there has been a push by some larger harbors that don't need as much dredging or maintenance to be able to use some of these funds for other uh, port improvements, dredging of other channels, and so forth. 
Um, and so there is some inclusion of that in the bill as well. Um, one point uh, that got a lot of uh, the environmental groups concerned, as well as some senators and congressional members, was streamlining of environmental reviews. Uh, the main aspect of this is to designate the Army Corps as the lead whenever there's a multi-agency review and to utilize comprehensive environmental review documents. Um, the slight differences between the House and the Senate have to do with the penalty for not getting the environmental review done on time. So in the Senate, that could involve um, potential financial penalties for the agencies. On the House, uh, once that review period is up, and an agency has not commented one way or the other, the agency is assumed to agree to the environmental review. So it's more of a, an acquiescence there. Um, and so what that final language will look like will be of great interest to many folks around. Um, additionally, the bill, both bills deal quite a bit with invasive species. Um, both bills included authorization for the Fish and Wildlife Service to coordinate Asian carp efforts in the upper Mississippi River and the Ohio River basins based very much on their role and the efforts that have been going on in the Great Lakes. Um, there's additionally a uh, provision in terms of the upper St. Anthony's Falls Lock and Dam um, and whether or not that could or should be closed uh, to prevent the movement of Asian carp. Additionally, both bills included some reviews of the current impacts of invasive species on the national budgets. Uh, one, uh, the House bill calls for cross-cut budget analysis from the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, to look at what is the total cost of invasive species, uh, a similar uh, requirement to be done um, internally within um, the Department of the Interior on the Senate side. So uh, either of those, I think, would be very informative for moving forward on just what are the costs of invasive species and you know uh, doing that cost benefit analysis of prevention. Um, finally, the big major difference I think that folks were looking at and it has been uh, the holdup during the negotiations has been on the project authorization. So these are new projects, new constructions, not very many of them at all in the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, both bills get at pretty much the same list of project authorizations, at least in the current time period, but how they get there is different. And I think um, what projects have been authorized or could potentially be authorized in the next year or two um, has been really where there's been a big difference in views as well as costs of the bill. So um, that's been the major point of negotiations. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to highlight the pilot projects that are included in the bills. And these are really meant to look at new ways for funding infrastructure projects, both water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure. And one of the big programs that's included on the Senate bill is what's called WIFIA. It's the Water Infrastructure Financing Innovation Act. It's based very much on what's called TIFIA, which was done for transportation. Um, and TIFIA has been, as far as I've heard, you know, very successful. Um, the House has said that they would like to look at a water infrastructure program similar but separate from WARDA. Um, so we're um, waiting to see what happens there. Um, I do know that um, the WIFIA provision on the Senate bill is a very high priority for Senator Boxer from California, who's the lead negotiator on the Senate side. So um, waiting to see what happens there. Um, Northeast Midwest Institute put together a side-by-side -side of the House and the Senate bills, and um, if this is put together as a, a PDF, you'll have a link to it as well that goes to our website. Danielle. Uh, so moving on to things that... Danielle, yes. this is Lisa. We've had a request. Could you speak up just a little bit, please? Oh, absolutely. Sorry about that. That's is okay. This, is this better? Yes. Or no? Well, okay. when you, you no. lean in a little closer, and then, then that'll be fine. All right. Perfect. Well, well, will project. Uh, so moving on to a couple things that really haven't seen any action just yet. The Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act, uh, some version of this bill has been introduced in the House and or the Senate since uh, at least the 111th Congress. Um, and what this does is this looks to authorize the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which has put in over $1.6 billion into the Great Lakes uh, since 2010 when it started. 
Um, the bill as it's written currently would also authorize the Great Lakes National Program Office, which is EPA, which does a lot of the administration work for the GLRI, as well as the Great Lakes Legacy Act, which is responsible for helping clean up the areas of concern uh, throughout the region. Um, only one of those have gotten delisted so far, that's Presque Isle near Erie, Pennsylvania, but quite a few are on track for delisting soon as far as we've heard. Additionally, um, as part of this bill, it would authorize an interagency task force, which helps EPA with uh, prioritizing and distributing the funds, as well as the Great Lakes Advisory Board, which is a non-federal body. Uh, it's chaired by uh, Dave Ulrich of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, and the co-chair um, is Patty Burkholz from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. Um, and so they've already been providing input and, and such to the Interagency Agency Task Force on the new uh, plan, work plan that's going to be developed for 2015 to 19. Um, currently, the bills differ really only in how much they authorize in total. The Senate authorizes $650 million in total, and the House authorizes $600 million. Um, the, I think the encouraging thing is that there's been some movement and discussions on how to get the bills moving forward in both the House and the Senate. Um, how that would happen has uh, drawn some conversation as uh, there's been discussion about um, that total authorization level. Um, so the, the GLRI program, which has included the National Program Office and the Legacy Act, has been authorized or better, I'm sorry, been appropriate, can giving funds at only about $300 million over the last few years, except for the first year. Um, so there's been discussion about aligning that authorization level with the appropriation level of $300 million, and there are certainly pros and cons to that. Um, additionally, there's been some discussion about uh, streamlining what the bill looks like, and so um, potentially also removing authorization of the Interagency Task Force and the Great Lakes Advisory Board. Um, with that. So we're following that and hoping to see some good movement on that moving forward uh, with it. So uh, additionally, as I'm sure you all have heard, the Army Corps released their Great Lakes Mississippi River Inner Basin study on January 6th uh, with eight options that focus primarily on the Chicago area waterway system. Um, other options that they had looked at had been released in previous interim reports. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that any of the options that the Army Corps presented uh, were quite expensive and long-term, 10 to 25 years, looking up to 18 billion, um, with a very strong question of whether or not uh, the Corps really needs new authority. Um, uh, if you look at past authorization of the original Glimmer's report, most folks would argue no. If the, if the Corps decided to choose one of these options, it could move forward tomorrow. Um, however, the Corps has expressed its hesitancy to do so without any further direction, whether that be from Congress, uh, local groups, and, and so forth. So um, uh, folks here on the Hill have been discussing options for putting into um, legislation some sort of direction for the core. The first bill that we've seen from that is from Representative Candace Miller called the Defending Against Aquatic Invasive Species Act. And what that does is directs the core to uh, plan and develop an option for hydroelectrical separation of the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Basin. Um, a couple of notes about that bill, it removes the requirement for a non-federal match. And generally that would be about 30-35%, so if you assume that the cost would be on the low side, about $10 billion, um, you would still be looking at a 3 to $3.5 billion non-federal need there. So um, I think that's a big aspect of the bill, at least a, a big speaking point. Uh, additionally, the bill requires consultation with local groups, including the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, the Great Lakes Commission, and the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, which operates um, the, the Chicago area waterway system. Um, I anticipate we'll start seeing some more bills come out as people look at other options that aren't full hydrological separation, um, and looking at just some ways to get the process moving forward. Um, the Army Corps report itself is, is huge. It's 250 pages plus another, I don't know, 6,000 pages in appendices. Uh, so we at NEMWI put together a one-page summary with a chart. So if you'd like to see that, that can be helpful. Um, moving on to where some opportunities still remain to be seen is surface transportation. 
So MAP 21 was the surface transportation bill that passed back in 2012, and it expires in September 2014, uh, right before the midterm elections. Um, this has been, this is a potential area where uh, legislation could move and things could be included in it to uh, go forward. And those different aspects could include uh, reform of the Highway Trust Fund, uh, use of, of public-private partnerships for uh, transportation infrastructure, water infrastructure funding. Again, I include here the Water Infrastructure Financing Innovation Act, WIFIA, um, if that doesn't get included in WERDA. Additionally, this is an opportunity for Asian CARP aspects. MAP 21 was the legislation that accelerated the Glimmer study originally back in 2012. Um, so there's certainly a precedent there <clears throat> for utilizing it on invasive species issues. Um, I think the bottom line here is that something needs to happen to prevent these programs from expiring. Um, so whether that's just a short-term extension, whether that's a full bill, um, we've heard that we'll start seeing some legislation by June. Um, so maybe July, in my opinion, on that. But that's also just something to keep in mind as things move forward. Um, moving on to appropriation. So fiscal year 2014 is done. Uh, many folks are very relieved of that uh, instead of having to draw it out into the spring. Um, the December budget deal that folks heard about removed the sequester from fiscal year 2014. And as a result, most budget lines were restored from the 2013 cuts that they saw. Um, Great Lakes program uh, did pretty well for 14. Um, I will include a link there to a chart that we have that shows some major programs from 12, 13, and 14. Uh, GLRI was restored to 300 million. It had gotten cut to about 285 due to sequester. SRFs were up. Um, beach grants were retained. Um, those tend to be uh, not a very large amount of money, but um, significant for beach monitoring and safety and tourism. Um, additionally, the Army Corps had additional funds to put together in a work plan, and quite a bit of those funds went to dredging projects around the Great Lakes. Uh, I think it's really a direct result of the fact that um, both Great Lakes task force members on the House and the Senate side weighed in with the Army Corps, encouraging their uh, utilization of those funds to support dredging projects in the Great Lakes. So I think for um, the Great Lakes, that was a great win to see. Um, looking at 2015, the budget from the president just came out a couple weeks ago on March 4th. Um, I'm hesitant to say regular order, but with an actual budget line number, budgets coming out fairly well in time, um, there, this might be what we call a normal appropriations process where there are hearings, there are bills put together, they're voted on in committee, they're voted on the floor, and then there's some sort of conferencing that occurs between the House and the Senate, whether formal or informal. Uh, given the fact that it's an election year, we'll see. Um, the uh, dredging funding for the Great Lakes wasn't horrible. It was about $48.4 million. I got that from the American Great Lakes Ports Association. Um, so. Uh, happy to see that moving upwards uh, from where it's been in the past in terms of the request around 40 million. Uh, the one large concern for the Great Lakes delegation has been the fact that the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative got cut in the request to 275 million. Um, on the upside, Asian CARP saw some um, nice increases. On, again, on the downside, state revolving funds. So um, this is another opportunity for input. So uh, wrapping up here, status, um, things that are done. Farm bill, Sleeping Bear Dunes bill, and the fiscal year 14 approves. WERDA is currently in the works and happening. Um, and then there are some opportunities, I think, for folks locally to weigh in. And those include um, the Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act, bills having to do with implementation of any of the glimmerous options, fiscal year 14 appropriations, and surface transportation. So with that, I thank you for your patience and uh, take any questions as they come. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, and I would remind participants to uh, raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon or typing your question. Uh, Danielle, I'll start. Uh, I wonder what you think of the um, the climate in and the conversation in Congress now about that 275 uh, million dollars for the 
uh, the president's recommendation for the GLRI. A number of us were in Washington a week or so ago for the Great Lakes uh, uh, commission meeting and had the opportunity to visit with members of Congress and our and our senators. And uh, even though the announcement had come, you know, just a, a day or so before, found them, to, at least the Minnesota delegation, to be very aware um, of that proposed cut and very interested in um, in increasing it once again to 300 million. And I wonder what you find the conversation in Washington to be about the um, the potential for moving that up to 300 million again. I would agree with you. I think folks are very. Um, I think folks are very upset that they saw the cut in the in the request from the president. I think uh, there's quite a bit of potential there um, to have uh, that moved up. There's a lot of support for the GLRI among the Great Lakes. There's a couple letters circulating right now, um, or that will be circulating um, on both the House and the Senate side to request support and it of the to be GLRI. Quite, quite bipartisan as well. Yes, and I think that's a very strong part of it that you will see bipartisan support on both the House and the Senate side. Um, there's letters that were sent last year that were bipartisan, and we'll see the same trend this year. This is other, uh, other questions, Lisa. This is Lisa. Yes, uh, Dave Biswas from Michigan has a question. Dave, yeah, your I'm line. Can you hear Dave, me Dave, your line is open. Can you hear me right now? Uh, very faintly, yes. Um, I'm trying to see if. Okay, I had um, I had a question on this uh, the, for the GLMRS, the um, the presentation they came and did that recently in Michigan, and. My thing was, outside of those eight factors, has there been other suggestions outside of that? I know some legislators around in Michigan have been looking at other options too. Okay, thank you for your question. I'm going to put you on mute. For so I think. Yeah, so I think there are some other options that folks are looking at. One that's been discussed, it's, it's the Brandon Road option. Um, so there's a lock and dam at Brandon Road that potentially could be revamped uh, more quickly than um, everything else. It wouldn't be a full uh, solution as it would really only protect the Great Lakes from things coming up the Mississippi River and would do um, very little to go from the Mississippi, for, for things moving from the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River. Um, but that's certainly an option that folks have looked at. The benefit of that is that it's uh, cheaper, it's quicker, and it likely wouldn't have as many or any impact on um, the flooding and or water quality issues uh, in Chicago and Lake Michigan. And that's where a lot of the funding and, and money and time are, are part of any of those options is dealing with the additional impacts of flooding, water quality, and such. Um, from separating the basins. So yes, I think people are looking at other options uh, with the, you know, noting that it's going to be hard to get that much money over that long a period of time. Okay. We have another question from um, Representative Todd Onstad. He asks whether lake levels are expected to increase significantly this spring after the winter we've had. Uh, well, I'm not an expert on lake levels, but uh, talking with friends that I have at NOAA and the Army Corps, I think they're hesitantly optimistic about it, um, given the fact that the lakes have frozen over. That's really helped with the evaporation issue that they've seen in past years. I think everybody's just sort of waiting to s and holding their breath to see what the, the spring rains would look like. Um, I can provide some links to some articles that I've read that I thought looked at the issue really well, if you'd like, Lisa. That would be very helpful, Danielle, and we can put that on our um, Great Lakes Legislative Caucus website along with the, your slides. And you had mentioned on one of your slides that you would provide a link to um, funding information. I think that was... Yeah, I, yep, and I can include that in the slide. I realized that it wasn't linked in the slide, so that'll be all, all in one place. Great, thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised or questions being typed, so Senator Rest, I think we can move on if you'd like to. 
Okay, thank you very much again, Danielle. It was a, a lot of information, but um, very important things that are going on regarding um, our concern and uh, about um, uh, about the Great Lakes and um, and our actually reason for being. So thank you very much for that. Um, now we're going to uh, use the rest of our time to go around the region and ask members of the caucuses. Uh, executive Committee to report on legislative proposals in their jurisdictions. Uh, for the audience members, if you have questions about any of the legislation that's covered, please, again, either raise your hand or type your question in the questions box so we can get an answer from the speaker. We're going to begin today with uh, Representative Robin Gable, who represents the state of Illinois. Representative Gable. Hi, I'm here for Robin Gable. To, can you hear That's me? That's just fine. Yes, go right uh, ahead. Uh, this is Karen. I'm her chief of staff. She was not able to uh, be at this, so I'm just really listening in, and I'm going to report back what I learned today. Fine. Um, then we'll uh, move on then north to Wisconsin. Uh, Representative Corey Mason is the executive committee member from Wisconsin. Representative Mason, are you there? I am. We'd be pleased to hear from you. Yes. Okay, great. Well, I think uh, the discussion in Wisconsin continues to be around the Great Lakes Compact and the proposed Waukesha diversion. Um, I've enjoyed conversations uh, at previous meetings with other members uh, about this issue um, for a couple of reasons. It occurred to me that you know, even though the compact only passed five, six years ago now, the number of legislators who weren't in office when it passed um, is, is larger than I would have guessed when we first started having these conversations. So um, I think as we have these meetings, basic sort of background on the Great Lakes Compact is going to be important. But to recap very, very briefly, the Great Lakes Compact was an agreement um, of all eight Great Lakes states uh, and a, with a, a lateral agreement with the Canadians in Quebec and Ontario uh, to not allow diversions outside of the Great Lakes Basin for water use. Um, and to start counting the amount of water that is used within the basin uh, for purposes of conservation. In the compact, there is a, a narrow exception that can be made for communities that are not in the basin but are part of the county where a part of the county is within the basin. So it would be water going out of the basin, but, um, but one part of the county that's asking is in it. And so in Wisconsin, we have the city of Waukesha that is asking for a $10 million, or I'm sorry, 10 million gallon uh, daily diversion from the Great Lakes Compact. And its its application is important not just because of what the Waukesha diversion wants to do, but because it's the first real test of the Great Lakes Compact and whether or not the diversion um, and, and the compact will have any real teeth to it. And it's going to set a precedent for, for many more diversion applications to come. Where, where where in the process is that application at this point? Yeah, so at this point, uh, the city of Waukesha has given its application to the DNR, our State Department of Natural Resources, which it is currently reviewing and needs to approve. Uh, and, and then after they approve it, it would go to uh, all eight of the Great Lakes governors uh, for their unanimous approval and to the two uh, provincial um, uh, leaders in Quebec and Ontario uh, for their uh, advice and input. Uh, before it to go forward, all eight Great Lakes states governors would have to sign off on it. It has to be a unanimous uh, vote of those governors. Um, and so, so for me, the, the concern about the – so I have two big concerns about it uh, from – well, three, really. The, the, the most parochial concern for me is the – the proposed return flow or, or treated sewage would go through a river that runs downstream through the heart of my district uh, and through Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, but the second is the, the diversion asks not just for water that they would like to have because they have some radon problems in their water that, that they would rather get Great Lakes water than, than find another way to, to treat their water. Um, but the, the Waukesha diversion calls for more water than they need now it, it calls for water that they anticipate they will need in its future so that they can grow and so the real test of the compact and whether or not 
um, the diversion qualifies for um, for use under the idea that look, you have no other standard, and this is you know the best you can possibly. There's no other place for you to go. Um, is is really, in my view, not being met here. I and mean, what they really want is is water for Great Lakes water for growth, um, mm -hmm. which is of course what everybody outside the Great Lakes Basin would like, um, having access to Great Lakes water, um, not for emergency purposes, for potable water, but for the opportunity to have economic development is precisely what the, the compact was established to guard against. And so it's a really important, it, it's not just a parochial issue, though. That how Waukesha is treated is really going to set the standard um, that's going to be in place, I think, for a lot of jurisdictions moving forward uh, as to how these diversion requests from communities outside of the basin, but in a county that that has some part of its county in the basin. And there are literally um, hundreds and hundreds of communities that would potentially be asking for additional water if the Waukesha diversion goes through in a way that allows for, for growth and economic development uh, as a key component of its application. So. The reason I, I keep bringing it up in, in this context is two reasons. Number one, um, it's a weird issue in that it's not a bill that needs to pass our house, house legislatures or that we need Congress to do. It's a bill where every governor and provincial leader um, in, in the states and provinces that we represent is going to be called on to make a decision or give input on the Waukesha diversion. But number two, how that decision goes may very well establish the, the rules and the, the means by which diversions in your community might be coming uh, and asking for diversions outside the basin very soon. Well, thank you uh, for that. Are there, are there any questions for, um, for Representative uh, Ramos on his update on the Waukesha um, diversion application? I don't see any questions in the queue, okay. um, Senator Ress, but I will mention, and uh, uh, Representative Mason, I think it was at your suggestion, for the caucuses 2014 annual meeting, um, we do have a presentation scheduled on the Waukesha diversion. Right, and I'm, I did mean to refer to <laughs> to uh, Representative Mason, not, not Ramos. We're going to move to him uh, next. Great. Um, Thank you. Representative Ramos is, a, is on the executive committee. Um, is the executive committee member from Ohio? Ohio. Representative Ramos, are you there? I am here. Great. Welcome uh, to the uh, webinar. Thank you very much. I thought uh, my colleague from Wisconsin might have got me off the hook there for a second. <laughs> uh, well, in in Ohio, uh, we haven't had a lot of movement this year. Obviously, our biggest concerns are still the invasive species uh, potential for invasive species problem, as well as um, the algal blooming, which uh, affects our lake, uh, Lake Erie, a lot more than um, than than the others because we are we're warmer, we're shallower, and we are the most um, both agricultural and uh, and industrial and uh, uh, surrounded by cities, we don't. There's almost no trees that surround uh, Lake Erie. Um, we created a commission, an official commission within the state government, whose whose sole purpose is to deal with Lake Erie issues. It's relatively new, but it's good that we have something that is uh, that is entirely devoted. Um, and we actually um, created a Healthy Lake Erie Fund. Um, which is a very small appropriation, less than a million dollars over two years, but but our uh, the main goal of it is to to implement recommendations, particularly dealing with the uh, uh, the nutrient issues with algal blooms, uh, to implement our uh, and educate our voluntary what we call four R's of nutrient management: the right source, right rate, right time, and right place. Um, this was developed and with input uh, from the Farm Bureau, which is uh, sort of a first uh, where the agricultural community is is um, basically buying into the issue, to the idea that that the their fertilization habits do have some effect on on algal blooms in the lake. And um, since there is buy-in and, and work with the with the farming community. Um, Although it is voluntary, there has been some uh, progress with that uh, 
there is some concern, I'm, I'm told, from just sort of anecdotally from farmers, just because we had such a long such, and a, such a snowy winter here, um, that if things thaw quickly, which they very well may do, um, we may have a bit of issues with folks following the four hours, but we're going to monitor that. Uh, so hopefully it won't be that big. Hopefully we'll be able to continue uh, our progress uh, in, in slowing uh, slowing that issue and uh, more to the point, continue the educational process. Um, the farmers uh, particularly would hope that it stays a voluntary program. Um, and that looks like that's what all the uh, legislative will we have is, 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 is to keep it voluntary. Um, our state is most likely to reaffirm our uh, concerns to the federal government. We do this every year at this point on, uh, on the issue of the Asian carp, on invasive species, and on um, the uh, Chicago Sanitary and Shipping Canal. Um, it's worth noting, just from our standpoint in Ohio, I don't know how, where, how this is around the country, um, that our congressional delegation of lakefront congressional uh, 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 congresspersons has shrunk from four members to three, so that's just one more issue we're having here of making sure that even our own people are are uh, are, take, are are looking to take care of the lake. Um, there are folks on both sides who some one side is trying to uh, ban fracking, gas, and oil exploration in and around the the basin and under the lake itself. That bill's not likely moving anywhere, although also positively. There's another side that, again, would like to attempt to take more and more and more water out of the lake for commercial purposes. That's looking like it's not going anywhere either, so I guess that's a draw. Um, we have started a bipartisan, uh, bicameral Lake Erie caucus. We've only had one meeting so far, but it looks positive, and we've already spoken um, with the folks who've done that to, uh, to work closely with the GLLC, and so hopefully we'll be able to um, have a uh, basically a larger uh, presence in Ohio uh, as far as Great Lakes issues are concerned. Um, we're not entirely certain what the last thing is. The our governors decided to reopen our budget. We're traditionally a bi bi uh, biennial state. Our governors decided to reopen it. We're, there's nothing specific that we know yet, uh, but we're hoping that you know we can we can do a little bit of good there too. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Representative Ramos. Um, any questions for Representative Ramos? Um, there is a question asking if Representative okay, Ramos. We, we're going, okay. There's a question asking if he's familiar with SB 150 fertilizer licensure. I. Representative not. Ramos. Yes, I'm not off the top of my head in that I am a House member. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. I'm I'm the world's worst person at numbers. Um, at the bill numbers. Yeah, that that's a bill that it, it started in the Senate, obviously, as a, as a SB. But it it is something that is is looking very. Um, it, it's looking like it's going to have some bipartisan support. It's looking like. Um, as I understand it, the senators that, that put it forward, um, and they are from agricultural communities, um, did try to get all of the stakeholders involved. And so there's some hope that, that that's going to have some positive movement uh, when it comes to the House as well. It, it's looking, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just starting its hearings in the House, uh, in, the, in the Agricultural Committee, which I'm not on. but. Uh, as I understand it, it's it's got some pretty broad support, and and what the bill does is it it, it deals with uh, state cost sharing for uh, abatement of soil erosion, degradation of state waters, etc., from farming practices. It would be the first time um, that we really had a full statewide policy that that uh, that did that, and 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 for the for the good of the entire basin, it's it's particularly important that that Ohio does that. As I said, we are one of the largest. Uh, largest agricultural um, uh, areas that's directly on the basin because we are almost entirely either city or ag as opposed to um, a lot of others that have you know forests and, and state lake shores etc so 
Um, it's looking good. It was unanimous in the Senate. Um, we're hoping to move it in the House relatively short order, as I understand. Okay, well, thank you very much again, uh, Representative Ramos, for your report. Uh, we're going to end with reports from Wisconsin and then finally from Minnesota, but I was wondering if there was any other Executive Committee member on the call that would like to take a minute or two to report from their state. Senator Rest, I don't see any other okay. hands thank raised. Then we'll, then we'll move to um, uh, uh, David Biswas from Michigan, um, who is on the webinar for Senator Mike Kowal. Uh, David, are you there? I see. There he is. Yeah. Can you guys hear me right now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah, Senator Kowal is working on a... Um... But you do need to speak up. Okay. You're very faint. Uh, maybe you can hear me better now. Um, Senator Kowal is working on an eight-bill package. We just introduced it about a few weeks ago. Um, basically what it does is it increases the penalties for the possession of aquatic invasive species. So if you have, for example, we have a situation here where they were transporting illegal Asian carp, this legislation would confiscate the truck, take away their commercial license, and to take away their commercial um, fishing license as well. Were you able to hear me on that? Yes. Okay. So, and we're going to start hearings on this bill. Um, it'll be in about two weeks. Thank you. What are what are its prospects? <laughs> I think you know. There's we have full support from. Uh, from our Department of Environmental Quality, our uh, Department of Natural Resources. So uh, we sh the goal is to, to be able to get um, at least the bills out of the Senate uh, before the end of the spring. Okay, well, good luck, and, uh, th and thank you very much for joining us this morning. We're going to end with a report from Minnesota. Senator we Rest. Have Senator yes, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do see a hand raised. It's Senator oh, Glenn, sure. Glenn, okay. Senator Glenn Anderson from Michigan. I'm opening up your line. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure if this uh, laptop had a microphone, actually. But, uh, but I did want to reach out and ask. Uh, I, I might have missed it if it was mentioned earlier. I apologize. Uh, but is there any uh, uh, work being done on plastic debris at the Great Lakes? Uh, anything at the federal or state level uh, that other states have been involved with? Danielle, that sounds like Hi, a... this is Danielle. I can... I'm going to mute yeah, your line, I Senator help, Anderson. Uh... <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so, um, uh, Senator, there is a bill that was introduced on in the Michigan House, I believe, by Terry Brown. Um, there was also a bill on um, microplastics introduced in the New York. And somebody just told me the other day that there was one introduced in the Minnesota legislature, but though I haven't had a chance to, to look at that. There's nothing currently at the federal level in terms of legislation, although um, the, all the articles, uh, especially the New York Times, excuse me, got quite a bit of attention. Um, so folks are looking at that in terms of where would the jurisdiction lie for uh, regulation and such. Um, so we've been working on that um, and have been reaching out uh, to Michigan and New York on their legislation and sort of where the prospects are. Uh, from talking with New York, they seem to be um, uh, uh, optimistic about the chances of the legislation. They haven't heard any real uh, uh, negative feedback on it. Um, Michigan less so. Uh, uh, so um, in terms of the, the chances for it getting any uh, hearing in committee. Um, so that's what I know on it. I don't know if anyone else can contribute uh, further and expand. Okay, thank you very much, Danielle. Lisa, were there any other questions? Uh, not, not at this time. 
Okay, well then we'll we'll move on to our final report from Minnesota. And um, rather than we have a few legislative initiatives, but but the good news and uh, and the exciting news from Minnesota is the um, the work and the progress that's been made on the St. Louis River AOC. And I have um, invited Nelson French from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, to uh, report on um, the good news from uh, the St. Louis River Estuary AOC. Nelson, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I, I guess I've been unmuted. So uh, Senator Rest, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to join the group today. and. We do have, indeed, some very exciting news in the St. Louis River AOC. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the areas of concern across the, across the Great Lakes, um, we happen to have uh, not only the largest working, working port in the Great Lakes, but the area of concern is the largest by geographic extent. And, uh, and as such, has been very complex. And uh, we're pleased to report that in the past, Three and a half years with the assistance of a GLRI grant, we have actually assembled an updated remedial action plan, which uh, I, I would phrase it as being bold and aggressive. Uh, the goal that we have established is to delist this area of concern by 2025. Um, it's in, the plan was developed in an inclusive way. Essentially, stakeholders helped develop the plan, uh, and we engaged over 100 partners <clears throat> in its development. Uh, ranging from non-governmental organizations to uh, uh, local, state, and federal uh, agency and, uh, and elected officials. So it's a broadly owned vision and a plan uh, that's ready to launch. And in that inclusive category, the uh, Duluth mayor uh, just this last week announced his vision for revitalizing the city with riverfront investments. Um, and, and it's exciting to see that in this community, uh, the leadership is indicating that completing the AOC work is the foundation for the future of uh, revitalization of the riverfront neighborhoods uh, in, the, in the community. Uh, and so the linkage between environmental uh, uh, restoration and revitalization and community revitalization is being made in spades here. Uh, finally, it's, it's, it's bold and aggressive. It's also a 300 to $400 million plan uh, across both states. Wisconsin is a partner in this effort. Uh, as is the Fond du Lac tribe, and we are scoping out the uh, the horizons for budgets, essentially for our uh, contaminated sediment remediation work, uh, for our habitat restoration work, where we have a goal of restoring 1,700 acres of shallow bay aquatic habitat, and finally we have uh, also some area of concern wide issues such as the aesthetic BUI and other things that we're working on. So it's a fairly costly plan, but we've, we've analyzed in the past 30 years, there's been over half a billion dollars invested in this work. And so we're simply going to be finishing it off over the next six to eight uh, to 11 years, basically. So um, one thing that we think is critical, and this came up as uh, Senator Rest and I were visiting members of our delegation during Great Lakes Week last week, is that this plan points out why it's important that we have a five-year authorization for the next round of the GRI. Uh, lest we get into a multi-year plan like this uh, and get year one and year two done and then have nothing available in years three, four, and five. So we think this, this uh, business plan that we've developed actually provides a compelling case for uh, the need for long-term authorization for the GRI. So, Anne, I'm not sure if that covers it from your perspective, but well, that's... I think that's a, uh, that's a great summary, and we certainly appreciate uh, the work that you and Commissioner Stein are, are doing to um, move forward on uh, um, the cleanup of, of, our, of our AOC. Thank you very much, Nelson. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to report in. Are there any other legislators on the webinar who would like to share information on legislation in their in their states or provinces? Um, Senator Ress, this is Lisa. I see a question from Representative Penny Bernard Shaber of Wisconsin. Yes. She asks, are there private funds being included as part of the payment for environmental cleanup and restoration in Duluth? Uh, yes, the uh, for the Minnesota side of the river, which Again, we're working with Steve Galarno in the Wisconsin Office of Great Lakes uh, very closely, but I'm closest to the numbers for the work on our side of the river. Uh, we estimate about $300 million for our restoration and remediation work here, and an estimated $100 million of that will be responsible party funds coming 
uh, primarily from the U.S. Steel uh, Superfund site. So there are private funds being included in those estimates. And again, that's, that number is a guesstimate. We don't know exactly at the end of the day what the costs or the responsible parties' costs are going to be for that cleanup. But that's what we're using for the estimates. Anyone else? Well then, um, in closing, I, I want to thank um, everyone who participated today, uh, including the, um, the caucus members and, and others who reported on bills that were introduced this session, and especially to Danielle uh, uh, Chesky. And to wrap up, I have just a few announcements regarding uh, caucus activities. The caucus staff maintains uh, state and federal Great Lakes legislative trackers as a service to legislators and staff. Newly updated trackers can be accessed by visiting the DLLC website and clicking on the Legislative Trackers tab that's located near the top of the, of the home page. The trackers reflect the work of caucus staff in monitoring key state and federal legislation regarding Great Lakes and water policy, and we rely on you, legislators and your legislative staff, to help keep the trackers complete and up to date. And if you have a bill to add to the trackers, please contact Tim Anderson of the caucus staff. I also want to take a re this opportunity to remind legislators on the call that if you're not yet members of the caucus, you can enroll by visiting our website. We membership is free and it's open to all legislators from the eight U.S. states and the two Canadian provinces in the Great Lakes Basin. I also want to remind caucus members that they have an opportunity to sign on a letter regarding the U.S. Army Corps uh, Engineers uh, Army Corps of Engineers draft report on the Great Lakes Mississippi River Inner Basin Study, or commonly called GLEMRIS. The study examined options for preventing the transfer of Asian carp and other aquatic invasive species between the two watersheds. Lisa uh, Hanairo uh, circulated the letter, letter in an email to caucus members this past Tuesday, March 11th. Please make sure to look over the letter and let Lisa know by March 24th whether you would sign on to the letter. Note that the letter will be from members of the caucus, not the organization as a whole. If you do wish to sign on, make sure to include in your reply an electronic copy of your signature for the letter. As to legislators who aren't yet caucus members, if you have an interest in the aquatic invasive species or the glimmerous study, this is a good time to become a member because you'll have an opportunity to take some action on behalf of the Great Lakes. The 2014 fight, another announcement, 2014, uh, 14, and the 2014 annual meeting of the caucus will take place on July 24th, 20 and 25th in Quebec City. We have a very special reception and dinner planned for the evening of July 24th with a full day meeting to follow on July 25th. Details are available on the caucus's website. Uh, early bird registration for caucus members has been open since February 10th and now general registration will open this coming Monday, March 17th. Finally, our 2014 series of webinars will continue next month with, I think, a very interesting uh, two-part webinar on nuclear waste in the Great Lakes region. We'll hear about where nuclear waste is stored, plans for moving it to storage or disposal facilities, and also plans, some real, some hypothetical, to construct disposal facilities within the Great Lakes Basin. The webinars will take place on, 11, on April 11th and, and April 18th at the same time, 10 Central, 11 Eastern. Registration will open soon, so watch for an email announcement to come from Lisa in the, new, uh, the, in the near uh, future. And now, Lisa, back to you. Thank you, Senator Rest, and thank you all for being with us this morning. Remember to watch for a follow-up message with information on where you can find the slides and the recording and other information that Danielle uh, Chesky mentioned. We'll have that on our website later today. Also, please take a minute to fill out the short survey. That will pop up as soon as we're done. I hope you'll join us again for a future webinar and that you'll let your colleagues know about this helpful resource for staying up to date on issues that affect the Great Lakes. This concludes our webinar. Have a great weekend, everyone.